Welcome to the Rusted Garden Homestead. In today's episode of Friday Morning Ramblings, we're really going to go over three things. Uh, one, I want to do a quick five minute tour of the garden, show you all the frost patterns on the leaves. I think it's beautiful and I think it's really important to enjoy the garden in as many ways as you can. So the frost has come, you know, I've harvested most of the warm weather crops. But let me show you the frost patterns. Number two, we're gonna go upstairs. I'm gonna show you my office. I just got that all cleaned up and set up again. Just show you some of the things I collect, but more specifically, I'm gonna talk about seed starting, show you the lighting system I have set up. So that might be something you wanna consider, you know, getting the materials over November and December, and we'll start seed starting come January. Sweet potato harvest that I just did. Really, really great production. Sweet potatoes. Generally speaking, mature in 90 to 120 days. I let these grow 150 days. I kept getting a question about how do you cure your sweet potatoes? And the, in quotes, the books, the internet say, well, you should cure them, you know, seven to 10 days at 85 degrees and 90% humidity. And I'm thinking to myself, who has that? I don't have that. So. What I do is I like to leave them outside, I don't know, five to seven days, let the skins dry a little bit. With this frost, I let my sweet potatoes go 150 days. I wanted to see how large they could get and I wanted to harvest it first frost. So they were covered last night. You don't want them to freeze. But if the temperatures are warmer, about seven days outside, and then I just bring them in, inside. I start eating them right away. The initial ones aren't as sweet. Maybe three or four weeks later when I get to the last of them, they're sweeter. Sweet potatoes need about a month to have the starches that are inside them convert over to sugars. And that's why you sort of cure them. Toughen the skin a little bit, but more importantly, to let the starches convert to sugars. So this is what I love doing when it frosts. This is cabbage. These are cool weather crops. They'll be perfectly fine. But just look at those beautiful leaves and the frost patterns on there. And these are kind of spiky crystals in certain places and the crystal formations or the patterns of frost change depending on how cold it is at night. I think it got down to about 28 degrees. You can see the the forms right there and and then, then how long does the cold or frost stay and even transition slowly from 33, 32 degrees you know slowly the, the patterns change on the leaves. I like just kind of walking around with my coffee and checking all that out. Some of the kale patterns don't look too cool on there, but these again are frozen through sometimes. They're going to defrost as the temperatures change, you know, in the morning and the plants are perfectly fine. That's what makes a cool weather crop. Some of them are really hardy in that maybe lettuce will get killed off if it's just cold freezing for a long time or the ground just freezes once but that's when they die off when the top inch of the soil freezes I mean look at the frost on there I think that's really cool when the ground freezes maybe an inch or so and stays frozen you know for five six seven eight nine days that's a lot of times when your frost tolerant plants um, tend to die off but kale cabbages that's Brussels sprouts back there they can really handle a hard frost the other thing that I need help with is on Tuesday November 9th 630 you know that I volunteer at Freetown Farm and that's part of the Community Ecology Institute it's the nonprofit well I've started a program with some people there called nourishing gardens and we are up as finalists for a change makers grant and I need people to be in the audience so I will put a link in the video description and you can sign up it's free you'll get a ticket sent to you via email and you can be in the audience while our two-minute pitch is presented and think of what we're doing really as Shark Tank for social change and we want to win the grant and there's a grant for people who uh, vote for the videos from the audience and you can help us out by voting for us. I would really, really appreciate it. We're gonna use that money to develop the program Nourishing Gardens and we're basically taking the program out into the community 
of Columbia in Howard County surrounding areas and just building gardens in schools and homes hopefully it uh, you know office space all over but I would appreciate that so this is what I like to do let's grab this one more space over here you can see all the tomatoes have died back they're just warm weather crops and it's you know something that I enjoy just checking out the frost patterns all right let's go inside I'm going to show you the office but really talk in depth about seed starting and what you need to get started this is the entrance to the rusted garden office the homestead here's where I moved my setup for the grow lights and I'll talk about that and if you want to hang around we'll walk through my office and I'll just show you some of the stuff I collect talk about a couple of things so seed starting it's November it's early but it does cost some money to get the stuff so I thought maybe if I introduced it now you know you could buy the parts and pieces slowly I highly recommend it you don't need all these levels you can get away with really just one level maybe two if it's just for you know a couple of people now while it will cost some money for this you know you have to spend money for a rack or a shelving unit I recommend getting the metal kind let's water drip through it's wide so you want something that's four feet long these are probably I don't know 24 inches wide but you want the seed flat to be able to sit all the way across through here get a couple under there you want it wide enough for two lights you can adjust the lights or you can raise with books the seed starting trays closer to the light you always want to be really close to the light when seeds are germinating if you don't do that they're going to get tall and leggy I'll talk more about that if you want to subscribe we'll start growing under here um, come late December early January those are LED lights right in the corner you can get those for as little as really fifteen dollars sometimes at Walmart up to twenty five dollars this is where I want to say do not unless you want to spend the money buy the expensive hundred dollar grow lights you don't have to worry about something called par value every time I do this video someone says this doesn't work you're not paying attention to par value all that you need the par value if you're going to grow plants indoors from seeds to flowering to fruiting to fruiting to harvesting you don't need it for transplants this is just for seedlings and transplants why do I say that because I don't want you to spend extra money when you don't need to these are the LED lights 5,000 lumens that's the intensity of light that comes down and this is probably at least 4100 Kelvin Kelvin is the kind of light so you want to be 4100 Kelvin or higher that mimics daylight and you want the intensity of light or lumens to be at least 5,000 lumens that's the perfect setup for 15 to 25 dollars to grow seed starts you're going to save a lot of money tomato plants transplants easily cost three dollars a plant now you know if you buy five plants that's 15 bucks you're already at the cost of one light so you understand that and you can also buy so many different varieties of seeds that you can't find as transplants so you can grow you know varieties of tomatoes that you would never find in the store of course if you've got a longer season you can plant all your seeds outdoors but I really like starting them indoors so a basic setup is a wire rack just like this I have it by a window but the window light is not enough to really make any difference I just put it in here so that I can maximize the space in my office two lights per four feet long these lights are four feet so I can put in one two three four flats and I have one two three four five shelving units this is plenty to grow everything that you possibly want in your house so we'll talk more about that but again let me just repeat because it gets confusing 5,000 lumens or higher 4100 Kelvin or higher you don't need to worry about the par value oh and you might need a heating mat too that's just a basic heating mat this room stays about 66 to 70 degrees depending on what I do with the heat pepper plants like to be warmer when they germinate 
closer to 80 degrees, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So a warming mat works really well. You don't need one for every plant. So this is my office. I like collecting old gardening related kind of memorabilia. This is the box is an old uh, seed box, you know, from the 1940s and 50s where these would just be mailed out, seeds would be in there. This is a soil test kit, you know, boric acid, something I use for controlling ants and some different things, you know, in here. This book I love, it's from the 1940s. It's called Chemical Gardening for the Amateur. Right now, let's see if I can get that title in. Right now, the whole world's against chemical gardening, and it's a little bit of a misconception. I understand it. All things are chemicals. Using human-made fertilizers, i.e. chemicals, won't harm you, your plants, or your soil if you use them properly. You don't have to, but chemical fertilizers get a bad name. I don't want to be spraying strange chemicals on my leaves and eating it, but as for gardening, compost is king or queen, and then those organic fertilizers that you buy, and then the chemical type fertilizers. A couple sprayers I have all over the, the, um, the office. I don't know why I lost my thought. Um, I really think they look cool. This is an old home and garden. Beetle bait, Japanese beetles. This is actually a can of cucumber seeds. This is how they were shipped, and they are still in here. You know, I don't think that they're viable. I don't want to open it, but that would be kind of a cool experiment. All kinds of things in here. Those are garden tobacco cards, some old games from the 60s, more tobacco cards. Some of the soil test kits that I collect. And it's just a lot of fun. Another seed box, old seed packs I really enjoy. This is an original Victory Garden um, really pamphlet, I guess, that came out in newspapers years and years and years ago. Cabbage Patch Kids, if you remember them, I'm going to try and grow these, but these are about 30 years old. Tomato seeds. It's another reason when you come over and you think about seed starting, you buy a seed pack, it's a buck eighty, two bucks, three bucks, whatever. Plenty of seeds in there. If you store those seeds, they're going to last easily three years, five years so you don't even have to buy more seeds you can just grow more transplants lots of magazines these are all organic gardening i really like this section let's start at the top you know different collectibles that's a display i made with some old tools this looks like a bomb but that's actually a japanese beetle trap made out of metal epsom salt old container old books, some sprayers. This is Cory's Slug Snail Death. That is a full box. It's the English formula, whatever that is. These are more toxic back then. Uh, slug and snail baits are now iron phosphate or sulfur baited. They're much uh, safer in general for your garden. Sprayers, that's an old cedar. Bunch of old seed packs. And then as we get down here, I think this is really cool. So this is again, more seed kits. Hot caps, which was just a product of cardboard that you put over your plants, just like that. These are from Germany, made in Germany. And that was just to keep them warm. So a lot of the principles that we use now, 2020, were used, you know, 75 years ago. Just putting a cap over your transplants keeps them warmer. This is what I love. So I also collect all the uh, chemical sprays that gave chemicals a bad name because in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, you pretty much could can or bottle anything and sell it. So this is called jet fog. You would spray this for small flying insects and look at, you know, the stereotypical happy homemaker from the 40s and 50s in a yellow dress just spraying these chemical fogs all over the place. I think that's um, kind of funny in a satirical kind of way, I guess. But these chemicals, no, I don't want to use those. I don't want to be spraying stuff that I'm breathing in or putting on my plants, but those chemical fertilizers are okay. You just have to use them the right way. Spinning around, this is the main office area. I collect 
old gardening books and you can get those really uh, cheaply or inexpensively at thrift stores and this is what I read. This is what I collect. I have some stuff from the 40s and 50s. But let me just pull back here. That's the basic setup. These are just crates. So if you want to kind of create something in your office or something that looks cool, the books are all in here. Again, different sprayers. Um, for whatever reason, I like, you know, just collecting old things. And these knobs from old faucets or whatever are pretty cool tools love the old brass sprays for hoses but this is just something that I like to kind of create an office space now I have so much stuff trying and I used to actually have I don't know if you remember but my lights were right here and it took up that space had them over here I didn't like that so this is storage cabinet I'm gonna paint it make it look older red white black but these are all my props that I use for the video. So this will get opened up and this is what I'll be using for the seed starting videos. Now my wife doesn't think this looks cool. It kind of looks a little bit shabby in here, but it's really, really effective. It's super light. That's why I liked it. I don't want to have to buy a big piece of furniture. All my seeds are in here and then coming around. Um, let me just give you a look at, if you've not seen this before, that's my property. It's a little hard to see. Let's see if I can open this up and get rid of the glare. That's the rusted garden aerial view. Pollinator garden we just passed. No dig garden right over there to the right of the shed. And then that's the main garden. I mean, I am really grateful to have found this property three years ago what I enjoy and I so much appreciate being able to share this with you all so here's why I edit my videos um, this is on the community tab of my YouTube channel and explains the um, change maker challenge that we're part of so again we are finalists and I will put the link in there it's free to be part of the audience. I will be in the audience watching. And you again get to see our two minute pitch for Nourishing Gardens. I really like this part. This is all the different chemicals that we were once allowed to spray crazily and nobody said anything. So I decided to collect them all. But gardening doesn't really change much. I mean for hundreds and hundreds of years it's basically doing basic soil prep taking care of your plants dealing with pests and disease and just growing vegetables that's why a lot of times you hear me get annoyed with the overcomplication of all these fancy packaging packagings I guess um, s s people wanting you to spend a lot of money for the same product like the organic fertilizers always compost is great organic fertilizers anything that's on sale um, shelf is going to be filled up. Love Scooby-Doo. Raised my kids on Scooby-Doo. This is what I used to watch in the early 70s. So I like also collecting things, you know, that have that, that meaning. So didn't really want to show you the bathroom, but I did want to show you the uh, property from the side. So this is the driveway, of course, that we come in. And if you see all those white containers, that whole space right there is planted up with 60 to 80 um, cone flower. They're Cheyenne Spirit and come next year all right in there should be You know five different shades of cone flower and I think it's gonna look really cool and then just a quick look To the rest of my property and if you kept going to the left That's where you start coming over to the garden. So let's let me show you this nice blank wall so we can <laughs> skip over the toilet And this is my office. This is where I make the videos. This is where, you know, I kind of think about what I want to design in my garden, think about video topics, all kinds of things. And I really, really do appreciate being able to have this number one. You know, I saved up 
my wife and I saved up for a long time to figure it out, raise kids in a specific area, but we were finally to get over here. So I just want to encourage you, you don't have to start with an acre or two acres or five acres or 10 acres. Just start learning about gardening now. And as you save money or your life circumstances change, you can expand and build your gardens. The first thing you have to do, especially, you know, for a modern homestead is to learn how to garden. And I do have a book, which I know is always cut into my videos. It's a big, a big part of my life because I really want to get the message out, you know, through video or in my book that you can change your lifestyle a little bit. We all have to work. We all have to pay the bills, but you can become more self-sufficient and begin to learn the skills you need to, to have, you know, a way to supplement food into your regular, you know, lifestyle. Again, I highly recommend setting up a grow light station. Follow me. I'll show you how to do all this. Don't spend a lot of money. Just get something basic. And I think you're going to have a good time. Thanks so much for watching. Please check out my seed shop at therustedgarden.com. And if you have space, set up an office. Collecting old garden uh, memorabilia is a lot of fun. And it's a great place to kind of think, appreciate your garden, and plan out what you're going to do for 2022. Thanks for watching.